Welcome back to Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. I'm going to begin today's segment with a quotation from the book Havelock Ellis on Life and Sex, Essays on Love and Virtue. Quote, Sexual pleasure, wisely used and not abused, may prove the stimulus and liberator of our finest and most exalted activities. Terence Hill, professor of health and development at the Australian National University, expanded on this idea of Ellis's in a paper entitled Sexual Pleasure and Well-Being. He observes that couples with discordant expectations about sexual pleasure can find their relationships crumbling. Deeply planted understandings about inappropriate behavior can cause individuals to feel shame or fear when faced with choices about their sexuality and particularly about their desires. People unable to achieve desired pleasures due to physical handicaps experience a loss of well-being that can be extremely distressing. The recognition and promotion of sexual pleasure as an integral part of well-being is one of the most challenging elements of the sexual health agenda. Professor Hill goes on to say, Many people are afraid of pleasure, particularly other people's pleasure. And by this, he means not only society, quote-unquote, religion, social groups, even governments, but also individuals and relationships. As we shall see later in this episode, many people, and men in particular, are afraid of their lover's pleasure. True pleasure, ecstatic, transcendent, exultant pleasure, is a force, is a power, too strong for them. Since we have raised the question of pleasure, let's begin by examining pleasure, sexual pleasure, per se. What is our experience, our feeling, our thinking about the erotic? What is eroticism? Georges Bataille was a French philosopher who was, among other things, the author of some of the most famous erotic novels in history. Your host has done him one better, actually several better, but that is perhaps a subject for another time and another episode. Bataille had something in common with a frequent visitor to these podcasts, namely Jacques Lacan, that being a wife. Hmm. Bataille made a distinction between three types of eroticism, the eroticism of bodies, the eroticism of hearts, and sacred eroticism. For Bataille, The eroticism of the body was superficial, cheap, simplistic pleasure. Sacred eroticism adds veneration and the sublime. Ideally, there is eroticism with a capital E. The category of God is embodied in the exchange of love, respect, and gratitude. In this highest form, the body becomes a gift, a generous handing over, that recalls death. For Bataille, there is nothing better than contact with a loving body, contact with a loving body's surface to calm the anxiety of being. Argentinian psychologist and psychoanalyst Alcira Alizade extends this to the concept of, quote, giving oneself a body, which is the function of support, support for love, Support for protection. As she puts it, the erotic covering is like a veil that covers the body, protecting it from the wind and weather of life. The body of one's fellow, of one's lover, moves close to one's own for care and for protection. In this way, a couple can be moved beyond the mere narcissism of falling in love, as she refers to it. In this podcast, we prefer to use the word lover rather than partner. When I hear the word partner, I think of law, accounting, and other business professions and arrangements. When two people are friends with benefits, do they have a limited partnership or a limited liability partnership, where each partner's liability is limited to the amount they put into the business? Hmm, but enough of my 
corporate musings. Before we return to Georges Bataille, three types of eroticism, bodies, hearts, and sacred, I would like to offer my own take on the notion of giving oneself a body. The human infant is more helpless at birth than the progeny of many other, perhaps most, other species, and remains helpless for a longer period of time. This gives the human infant the opportunity, if you can call it that, to go through the trauma of the stages of infantile development, infantile sexual development, as outlined originally by Sigmund Freud. Or, from the perspective of the object relations school, those who inherit the intellectual legacy of Melanie Klein, of the depressive and the paranoid schizoid positions. The mother's breast is the good breast when it is present for the child, and the bad breast when it is not. Thus, throughout life, it becomes difficult to accept anything, including any person, as being entirely good. There's a good Jane and a bad Jane. A good Randolph and a bad Randolph. I haven't met him lately, have you? I don't think he exists, actually. Another consequence of this is that our experience of other people is often as part objects rather than as whole objects. As far as giving oneself a body is concerned, this is a task which we need to perform in life, throughout life. We each must strive to give ourselves a whole body through what French philosopher Michel Foucault called care of the self. Care of the self constitutes lifelong work on one's body, mind, and soul in order to better relate to other people and live an ethically driven life. As Foucault wrote in his book, Subjectivity and Truth, it is a matter of acts and pleasures, not of desire. It is a matter of the formation of the self through techniques of living, not of repression through prohibition and law. Hats off to Foucault. However, my idea of giving oneself a body is even broader. Your body is a gift from you to yourself. And when you receive that body, don't just say, oh no, you really shouldn't have. Accept that body and cherish it. Sculpt and mold it through yoga and exercise. Respect your body as a thinking body. Don't treat it like a car or a motorcycle whose job is to get you around and occasionally be given pleasure by someone else. Your body is your mind. Your body is you. You have sex with your body and you have sex with your mind. All at the same time, there is no separation between the two. In a highly illuminating article by Carlos Joao Correa, professor of philosophy at the University of Lisbon, the author observes, quote, The eroticism of hearts naturally translates into the domain of human passions, and, as Georges Bataille suggests, the passions prolong the eroticism of the body, conferring upon it a strand of moral sympathy. However, if it is not a cynical experience, passion is associated with a strange combination of joy and suffering. Bataille's description of the passion or eroticism of hearts is, in my view, that is the view of Professor Correa, one of the most lucid that I know of because it transcends the romantic apology, but also transcends the cynicism that prevails in the contemporary world. However, the revolutionary character of Bataille's thesis is instead that the purest eroticism, the purest eroticism, is found in the experience of the sacred. And why? In the first place, because the sacred is present both in the eroticism of bodies and also in the eroticism of hearts. After all, if it, that is the sacred, were not present, there would be only instinctive sexuality and an obsessive neurosis. Unquote Professor Correa. However, then, there is the sacred. 
but Taya's loftiest manifestation or incarnation of eroticism. Can we conflate the sacred with the spiritual? Is the spiritual necessarily an experience of the sacred? Correa reminds us that in the pre-Christian era, sacred was the most appropriate term to describe the ambivalent feeling of a community in the face of a religious sacrifice. We envision in our minds the sacrificed animal, the deer or the lamb, even the elk or the goat on the altar. We envision its blood. We envision the priest with his knife. But most important, one recalls here Sophocles' play Iphigenia in Aulis. The play revolves around Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek coalition both before and during the Trojan War, and his decision to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia to appease the goddess Artemis and thus to allow his troops to set sail to preserve their honor in battle against Troy. The play, as it exists in manuscript today, ends with a messenger reporting that Iphigenia has been replaced on the altar by a deer. It is, however, generally considered that this is not an authentic part of Euripides' original text. So this play, written in the final year of the life of its author, ends in the death of a young woman, a girl, whom we, like the people of Greece, had come to love. In the Latin languages, sacrifice means, in fact, literally, to do something sacred, sacrum facere, or sacrum facere, if you pronounce your C's in Latin like that. The victim, through ritual, would communicate with the divine dimension and, as such, would be, on the one hand, venerable, and, on the other hand, admirable. Unquote again, Professor Correa. When we see Georges Bataille use the word sacred, we associate it with religion, each in her or his own personal way and based on her or his own personal experience. What have been my experiences of the sacred? When I knelt beside my former fiancé in a small chapel of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York to receive communion, the bread and the wine standing in for the blood and the body of Christ, a few moments before I proposed marriage to her in another part of the cathedral. That was, for me, one form of spiritual experience. However, I have had many others. Bataille, being Bataille, takes the notion of the sacred not quite synonymous with the spiritual, but pretty darn close to it, in perhaps, in perhaps a more illuminating direction. In his book, Eroticism, he writes, in a fundamental way, what is forbidden is sacred. Negatively designating the sacred thing, prohibition not only has the power to give us, on the religious plane, a feeling of fear and trembling, but turns also that feeling into devotion or rather worship. The transformation of fear into devotion and worship. The gods who incarnate the sacred shake those who venerate them, but they are nevertheless venerated. Human beings are simultaneously subjected to two movements, that of the terror that rejects and that of the attraction that demands the respect that is fascinated. Prohibition and transgression correspond to two contradictory movements. Prohibition rejects, but fascination introduces transgression. The prohibition, the taboo, is opposed only to the divine in one sense. But the divine is the fascinating aspect of prohibition. It is the prohibition transfigured. 
we must not lose track of the fact that Bataya is thinking of the sacred, of what is sacred, as an aspect of and a form of living eroticism. For him, the most intense experience coincides with eroticism, not so much of bodies or souls, but of sacred eroticism. In strict terms, it is a pleonasm, insofar as eroticism and the sacred are the same. Switching terms for a moment, does this mean that eroticism and the spiritual are the same? Inasmuch as this podcast stands steadfastly by the principle that the body and the mind are the same, we are in fact tempted to embrace this notion. However, however, a big however, does not the spiritual entail, even in a certain way imply, even in a certain way demand a purification Or is a purification manifested and performed in one way or another not a, if you will, prerequisite for pure eroticism? Just as English 1A is a prerequisite for a class on James Joyce, or for that matter, for a class on Bataille's novels, Madame Edwarda, Story of the Eye, Blue of Noon, or The Solar Anus, cleaning out your garage is easy particularly for someone like me, whose mother was a hoarder, as have been several friends, including girlfriends, over my brief time here on Earth. Sweeping out the cobwebs in your mind to achieve purification, and perhaps, most important, pure intent, is much harder. What has been my path to achieve this? I do not for one moment eschew Tantra, In fact, I value it very highly. That having been acknowledged, my personal path to purification has been through Sigmund Freud, through making the unconscious conscious, where once was id, now ego shall be. I never equated love with romantic fantasies on the one hand or with having lots of sex on the other. The body and the spirit, whatever term one wishes to use, are the same. One loves with one's body-spirit. One honors one's beloved with one's body-spirit. Whether or not there is sex there, whether or not there is a relationship there, love is worship without illusions, without expectations, without the need for any fulfillment beyond itself. This is why love has power. Love is never needy or demanding. It is joyous, giving, and respectful. Love is bhakti. I undertook advanced study of the literature of bhakti while I was an undergraduate. The lessons I learned have remained with me. On my most recent episode of this podcast, which is essential listening for everyone, I interviewed the esteemed authority on Tantra, Anita Di Francesco. During the course of that interview, she was discussing aspects of the divine feminine. You really need to listen. There is no point in my attempting to summarize her highly articulate and evocative words. She asked me if I had ever worshipped a woman other than her, which I really rather do. And again, this brings me back to my bhakti readings. The meaning of the term bhakti is analogous to but different from kama. Kama is in the Kama Sutra, connotes emotional connection, sometimes with sensual devotion and erotic love. Bhakti, in contrast, is spiritual. A love and devotion to religious concepts or principles that engages both emotion and intellection. The word bhakti should not be understood as uncritical emotion but as committed engagement. So, having made my unconscious conscious and replaced id with ego, I am nevertheless left with my desires. After all, the id is a furious shopping mall of desires, all beckoning me with short skirts and neon. 
So now that my repressed desires are all right smack dab in the middle of my consciousness, what the heck am I going to do with them? Including, I might just as well come out and say it, my sexual desires. Enter Bhakti from stage right. Bhakti teaches one to transform. Perhaps I should say elevate, or even better, apotheosize those desires into, as I said a moment ago, worship without illusions, without expectations, without the need for any fulfillment beyond itself. Athenaeus of Naucratus was a Greek rhetorician and grammarian, flourishing about the end of the second and beginning of the third centuries A.D. Several of his publications are lost, but the 15-volume De Hypnosophistae, the dinner table philosophers or the doctors at dinner, mostly survives. Needless to say, I have read the entire thing in Greek, beats the Harry Potter books, even the Shades of Grey books, all to heck. And on top of that, it has the most resonant final sentence in the history of literature. These are not the mere games and jests of a Socrates still young and handsome, but the serious disputations of the doctors at dinner. For whether you are at the beginning or at the ending, what is more important than what you most desire. In terms of desire, my final word on the subject is that love is never enough. Love will not get you what you desire. So, purify your mind via the Freudian path, then bhakti. Hey, wait a minute. I bet you're still all hung up on what we're here to talk about here in Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. In other words, namely, the R word, relationships. And the sexual relationships between men and women in particular. What gives, anyway? What's the deal? Well, I'm going to explain it all to you <laughs> with the hope that you don't end up giving up on the whole thing. As the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said in his mammoth work, The World as Will and Representation, lovers are traitors who secretly seek to perpetuate the whole want and misery of life, which would otherwise come speedily to an end. But back to other notions of sexual relationships between a man and a woman. French psychoanalyst Andre Green reminds us of Kleinian psychoanalyst Donald Meltzer's writing about the sexual relationship between man and woman as a threefold structure in the relationship. In its deepest, most basic primal meaning, the woman is in distress and in need and in danger, the man is her servant her benefactor, and her rescuer. She is in distress at the plight of her internal babies, in need of supplies to make the milk for her external babies, and in danger from the persecutors her children have projected into her. She needs good penises and good semen and must be relieved of all the bad excreta. She will be content, satisfied, safe, while he will be admired, exhausted, exhilarated, triumphant. So, one might well ask, where do sensuality and pleasure fit into all of this? And how does so-called Western civilization see pleasure? The question reminds me of what Mahatma Gandhi answered when someone asked him, what do you think of Western civilization? It would be nice, Gandhi said. 
According to Plato in his dialogue The Philebus, pleasure is the fulfillment of a lack or the satisfaction of a need, whereas for Aristotle, as set forth in his Nicomachean Ethics, pleasure is the unfolding or the expression of an activity. For both of these philosophers, the ontological question concerns the moral value of pleasure. Is pleasure as such a good, or are only certain enjoyments under certain circumstances good? Or might pleasure even qualify as the highest good? Is pleasure the most valuable thing to which all of life's affairs are subordinate? Here as well, Plato and Aristotle have different opinions. Plato is far more reticent than Aristotle with regard to the moral value of pleasure. Some philosophers, including Plato, have questioned whether pleasure itself is actually a good thing. This brings us back to the criticism we have made of Plato in the very first episode of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. In his Allegory of the Cave, Plato tells us that what we see, touch, breathe, taste, smell, enjoy, and experience in our physical world is a pale shadow of the ideal things which exist elsewhere. These ideals exist in the mind of God, although Plato does not necessarily express it quite like that. This is why Friedrich Nietzsche described Christianity as organized Platonism, with its emphasis on heaven, the emphasis on sin, the emphasis on the evils, all around us in this world. For Freud, pleasure was the perception of a change in one's own body, and more specifically, it is the feeling of satisfaction of a drive or need. Note that here Freud is closer to Plato than he is to Aristotle. Interesting, perhaps ironic. We'll get back to this. French psychoanalyst Didier Anzieux came up with the notion of the skin ego the first narcissistic envelope on which the feeling of well-being is based, suggesting, for example, that narcissistic personalities possess an unusually thick skin ego, whereas in contrast, masochistic and borderline personalities show remarkably thin skin egos. This makes me think immediately of relationships, of how a person who is not technically a narcissist may possess a thick skin ego and attract or be attracted to parties, even if they are not masochistic, who have thin skin egos. It's the dynamic, it's the mechanism of all of that. Argentinian psychoanalyst Alcira Alizade writes of the skin ego as the precursor to the ego rooted in the biological body as a primal starting point for a trophic flow of sensuality. It is an imaginary intermediate space which links the archaisms of the senses, enveloping them in a phantasmagoric covering of skin, from which the subject organizes his effective and instinctual ego. Anzio also held that, quote, tactile sensations allows the basic distinction in infancy of the within and the without. So as much as we valorize touch, the caress, and so forth, we should perhaps recall that when touch is initially encountered, it was the vehicle for the infant's learning of the distinction between the within and the without, and therefore between the self, a term evolving, but how and from what, and the other, the self and the other. Philosophers, phenomenologists, and even religious scholars are always asking that question. Anzia would extend the concept of the skin ego to a broader notion of a psychic envelope, exploring, for example, the idea of the dream envelope. This is the name Anzia gives to the fine dream film, the fine ephemeral membrane, which he thinks of as replacing the tactile envelope of the ego's vulnerable skin. So I would ask, in what wise the dream envelope is another protective shield, or to use a stronger word, barrier to, in effect, create isolation between the self and others? Anzio also wrote of a sound envelope, which articulates the bodily ego's relation to psychic space in terms of breath, 
Anzio's view of breath as something defining a psychic space is intriguing in light of the role that breath plays in the vast majority of religions and spiritual systems. The concept of breath figures prominently in the development of thought in many religions. Egyptian Ka, Hebrew Nefesh and Ruah, Greek Suke and Pneuma, Latin Anima and Spiritus, Sanskrit Prana, Chinese Ki, Polynesian Mana, and in the language of the Iroquois, Orenda, all demonstrate that the theme of breath has a major place in humanity's quest for religious understanding. Moreover, theological conceptions of breath have led many of the world's traditions to feature respiratory exercises in their religious disciplines, especially in Asia and among groups influenced directly or indirectly by practices from the Indian subcontinent. However, breath and breathing have been a focus of other religions and cultures outside of India and adjacent countries, including those of ancient Greece, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and the cultures of China and Tibet. Central to the yogic endeavor of Taoism is the theory of the five vital breaths located in the heart, spleen, lungs, liver, and kidneys that keep these organs functioning and without which the body perishes. The five breaths are necessary, otherwise the body perishes. Consider These vitalities have their source in the brain, and when they converge again in the head into one vitality, a golden light is made manifest. This system of vital breaths is held to correspond to the interaction in the body of the five basic elements, heart, fire, spleen or stomach, earth, lungs, metal, liver, wood, and the kidneys, water. The vital breaths are linked to one another by a network of eight main psychic channels that, when clear, have two distinct roles. The unimpeded flow of the generative force and the unrestricted circulation of the vital breaths. This network contains a microcosmic orbit with four cardinal points. At the root of the penis, where the generative force is gathered, at the top of the head, and at the two points between them in the spine and in the front of the body, where the generative force is cleansed and purified during the microcosmic orbiting. And so the breath. So the breath. So many of us ignore our breath and breathing, consider it like something we don't need to pay attention to, like our heartbeat. That ain't the case. It's something we need to pay attention to, something we need to recognize as a spiritual element and spiritual force, regardless of which system, which set of concepts one embraces, whether it be the Taoist or one of many others. Now let us turn once again to something which is inextricably intertwined with sexual sensuality, namely the issue of gender itself. Not only various views of gender identity and differentiation, but also of gender viewed from a neuropsychological perspective, which means how men's and women's brain react differently to stimuli and experiences. In his seminar of 1972 and 1973 entitled On Feminine Sexuality, The Limits of Love and Knowledge, interesting that those two ideas are paired Feminine Sexuality, and the Limits of Love and Knowledge. Limits of Love and Knowledge. Jacques Lacan spoke of jouissance, which means both enjoyment and specifically orgasm in French, in excess, orgasm beyond the phallus, as something that women can experience. He said that there are two categories of women, the first being woman-women, those who touch witchcraft and mysticism, those who deal with God and the devil, those who fly from their bodies to unknown regions, those who incarnate the real. As Alcira Alizade so poetically describes orgasms experienced by this type of woman, it is possible for the whole body to become an erogenous zone in which senso-perceptive waves and diffuse billows of voluptuousness develop 
like multiple epicenters. To the mythical, uproarious orgasm in the masculine way, which also happens in a woman's body, by the way, is added the joyful surface of the erogenous affective body, which is permanently rediscovering itself. Every woman goes as far as she can with her body. I repeat, every woman goes as far as she can with her body. Jacques Lacan is famous for saying that woman is not whole, that's in quotes, and woman does not exist, that's also in quotes. He has, understandably, received much criticism for these statements, even though what he meant is clearly stated in his seminar of 1972-1973, as quoted before, on feminine sexuality, the limits of love and knowledge, from which I shall now quote again. The not whole becomes an equivalent of that which, in Aristotelian logic, is enunciated on the basis of the particular. There is an exception, but we could, on the contrary, be dealing with the infinite. Then it is no longer from the perspective of extension that we must take up the not whole, patut. When I say that woman is not whole, and that that is why I cannot say woman with an uppercase W, it is precisely because I raise the question of a jouissance that, with respect to everything that is encompassed in the function of the phi key, is in the realm of the infinite. Now, as soon as you are dealing with an infinite set, you cannot posit that the not whole implies the existence of something that is produced on the basis of negation or contradiction. To posit a there exists, one must be able to construct it, know how to find what that existence is. So woman is not whole because woman is infinite, and things that are not whole are infinite by definition. They're incomplete. They're incomplete because they cannot be completed. Curious and important to notice this. The not whole of woman means that she is always incomplete because she continues to extend out to infinity. 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 I remind my regular listeners that the infinite and our, meaning our cultures, our civilizations, our religions, inability or unwillingness to come to terms with the infinite is a regular theme of this podcast. How does one define, meaning assign a single circumscribed category and definition, something, in this case woman with a capital W, something that is infinite? Woman is humanity's opening into the infinite into infinite pleasure, infinite love, infinite sensuality, and infinite wisdom. And perhaps in line with one of our recent episodes, and per the philosophy of David Kellogg Lewis, there are multiple universes, always, if you will, branching off. And we are in those universes, multiple we's, multiple eyes, multiple you's, and that those universes are infinite in time and space, which, of course, are the same. Now let's talk about the brain and how it deals with sex in women and men. More a nucleus than an obvious structure, the amygdala is located deep in the limbic area of the temporal lobe and is considered the main sensor of emotion, specifically of threat and loss. In males, its right side appears to activate when stimulated, and the medial preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus, larger in males and crucial for male sexual arousal, is the epicenter of male sexual urges. But, vive la différence! In females, the anterior commissure, a primitive structure tying the two hemispheres, linking unconscious with conscious material, underlying this in your notes, it will be on your next quiz, is larger than in males. This dimorphism may explain why females seem more emotionally aware and more skilled in verbalizing emotions. A woman's left brain, the analytical side, is more extensively connected 
to her emotional right brain than a man's. So to enjoy sex, she not only has to feel safe emotionally with her right amygdala, but also has to know that she is safe cognitively with her left amygdala. Makes sense? Again, the great connection in a woman's brain absent from that of a man. In addition, females have a more complex and circuitous arousal pattern. Beginning in the ventromedial hypothalamus, a woman's sexual readiness is primarily controlled by estrogen and progesterone and so depends on her menstrual cycle. These neural hormones do double duty by preparing her to be emotionally receptive and trusting of her mate. The estrogen incites oxytocin genes in neurons within the hypothalamus, elevating production of the brain chemical oxytocin. And when estrogen combines with progesterone, the oxytocin receptor fields in the ventromedial hypothalamus flourish dramatically, signaling the reflexive posture of lordosis, the arching of the back via intricate circuitry in the spinal cord. Mental and emotional readiness, coupled with a sexually receptive body posture, signals her mate that she's sexually available. Not only women's neurological means, but even their aims appear more subtle than men's. During high sexual arousal, a woman's left amygdala is calmed, dispelling anxiety, and her left lateral orbitofrontal cortex, responsible for conscious emotions, seems to decrease in blood flow, indicating its disinhibition to allow bodily pleasure and joyful sex. Precisely, this lessening of stress and of rational control allows orgasm in women just as deactivation of the left and right amygdala favors performance in men. So as I do on occasion, I'm going to repeat a sentence which I think is really key. During high sexual arousal, a woman's left amygdala is calmed, dispelling anxiety, and her left lateral orbitofrontal cortex, responsible for conscious emotions, seems to decrease in blood flow, indicating its disinhibition to allow bodily pleasure and joyful sex. I want to take note that the above summary is due to research by a number of women psychologists and other medical researchers. This is not a male-originated set of concepts or descriptions. Anyway, Orgasm? <laughs> Did anybody say orgasm? <music> giving an orgasm, having an orgasm, giving better orgasms, having better orgasms, having multiple orgasms, not having an orgasm, never having orgasms, faking having orgasms. However you look at it, orgasm is not simple. That having been said, orgasm is something our bodies are designed to experience a goal of much sexual activity, and a source of potentially intense pleasure and fulfillment. It is also highly symbolic, with meanings far exceeding the physiological, quote, reflex, unquote, of orgasm. Much personal, interpersonal, sociocultural, and sociopolitical importance has been placed on orgasms, especially in recent decades, and it is now situated as an indicator of healthy sexuality and healthy relationships. In other words, people judge relationships on the basis of orgasm. In a certain way, you can't get around it. It keeps coming back to haunt you. Australian psychologists Emily Operman, Virginia Brown, and their colleagues conducted real-life research on a sample of 119 young adults aged 18 to 26, mean age 20, who completed a survey 97 were women, 21 were men, and one individual identified their sex as other. The results of their study were published in the Journal of Sex Research. An inclusive approach was taken so that non-heterosexual participants were not excluded with the aim of reporting meanings of orgasm that no longer reflected only heterosexual experience. These researchers did in-depth interviews of their subjects regarding their personal experiences of sexual activity and specifically their personal experiences of orgasm. Here are some highlights of their research. 
Orgasm, signaling the end of sex, was not a gender-neutral phenomenon. It was predominantly men's and not women's orgasms that signaled the end. I see his orgasm as the end of sex, one woman said, for both men and women. Several participants reported explicitly that the man's orgasm was the end of heterosexual sex, regardless of whether the female partner had an orgasm. Quote, I find men's orgasms to be more important than women's orgasms, and sex ends when the man orgasms whether or not the woman has orgasm. Quoting one of the people they studied in their research. Some women reported that their opportunity to experience orgasm was precluded by this framework. For example, quote, if he orgasms before we have reached intercourse or have very short intercourse, it makes me feel angry because we have to stop when he is satisfied, but I am not, and I want to go on for longer. Well, if he orgasms before anything else happens, boy, that's a bad deal for the woman. I mean, anything else, you know. Anyway, associated with male orgasm signaling the end of sex, the typical pattern of sex and orgasm for heterosexual participants reported was the woman orgasming first via various means such as oral sex or mutual masturbation, followed by the man, usually via coitus, and then sex was over. Interesting. In a certain way, it's nice to see that this was a typical pattern. I'm commenting there. As one participant described, quote, I usually orgasm when more focus is on my clitoris. After orgasm, I usually stop, change positions, and then continue intercourse until my partner orgasms. Finally, participants frequently, implicitly and explicitly, identified men as having responsibility for women's orgasms and for ensuring that women orgasm first. For example, quote, My partner always makes an effort for me to orgasm before he does. Other female participants reported other experiences along the same lines. Quote, I can't orgasm through sex alone. I have to have clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm. And when I do, I always orgasm. Quote from someone else, I am unable to orgasm from sexual intercourse and usually do from oral sex afterwards. Okay, that's changing the scenario a little bit. Interesting. If my boyfriend and I just have sex, meaning penetration sex, I do not orgasm. For some women, certain coital positions facilitated orgasm. For example, I was on top. That's the only way I can reach orgasm. One interesting finding in this research is that women report that they are fine achieving orgasm through their partners performing clitoral cunnilingus and then proceeding from there to vaginal coitus. The researchers did not mention any women stating that they had subsequent orgasms during penetration or of their clitorally induced orgasms then continuing during penetration sex which, if I may venture a comment, is a wild ride indeed for both the woman and the man, and which can result in multiple orgasms for both of them. Just as a footnote, and I do so wish that I could somehow incorporate footnotes into the podcast format, I would like to remind my listeners once again that this is a survey of, as Robert Redford might say, ordinary people, who presumably have learned about sex in the usual way, by trial and error, gossip, and the usual parental disinformation. Some may have heard about Tantra or the Kama Sutra, you know, just a little snippet in a magazine somewhere. However, what they have doubtless never heard of are other spiritual fundaments for sexual and sensual knowledge and inspiration. In Chinese Taoism, the Dong Shui Fang Shu Shu, Bedchamber Arts of the Master of the Grotto Mysteries, which was likely written by the 7th century poet Liu Zhangkuang, contains explicit descriptions of the sexual acts that was supposedly transmitted from Zhu Tong Zhang Zhu. The sexual practices that Zhang Xiang Zhu supposedly taught 
were often compared to alchemy and physiological procedures for prolonging life. There are, in fact, a number of traditions, religious, spiritual, and otherwise, which explicitly associate sexual activity with a prolongation of life. Have sex a lot? Live longer. Live longer so you can enjoy more sex. Very happy formula. However, back to Taoism. In Ge Hong's Rong Shu Xi, there's a passage in which Shuang Chang Zhu tells Huang Di that sexual techniques are, quote, like the intermingling of water and fire. It can kill or bring new life, depending upon whether one uses the correct methods. Taoism is also interesting because of its valorization of male homosexual sex and relationships. Chua Shen, the leveret spirit, is a Chinese Shenist or Taoist deity who manages love and sex between men. His name is often colloquially translated as Rabbit God. The Wei Ming Temple in the Yonggei district of New Taipei City in Taiwan is dedicated to Tuer Shen, the Rabbit God. About 9,000 pilgrims visit the temple each year, both to pray and to find a suitable partner. The Wei Ming Temple also performs love ceremonies for gay couples. Then there is specifically sex magic. Sex magic is a term used for various types of sexual activity used in magical, ritualistic, and otherwise religious and spiritual pursuits found within Western esotericism, which is a broad spectrum of spiritual traditions found in Western society or refers to the collection of the mystical, esoteric knowledge of the Western world. One practice of sex magic is using the energy of sexual arousal or orgasm with visualization of a desired result. Have sex, visualize what you want, and that thing that you want, if you visualize it during sex, will come to you. And uh, here, once again, we are brought back to synesthesia, orgasm accompanied by visualization. A premise of sex magic is the concept that sexual energy is a potent force that can be harnessed to transcend one's normally perceived reality. The earliest known practical teachings of sex magic in the Western world come from 19th century American occultist Pascal Beverly Randolph, under the heading of The Mysteries of Euless. In the latter part of the 19th century, sexual reformer Ida Craddock published several works dealing with sacred sexuality, most notably Heavenly Bridegrooms and Psychic Wedlock, all of which leads us to Aleister Crowley, to whom perhaps we must need to devote an entire episode Crowley believed that sex was the supreme magical power. In the organization stemming from Crowley's thought and practices, collectively referred to as the Lema, the Ordo Templi Orientis, 9, 1x, is the OTO degree in which heterosexual magical techniques were taught for magical creation by male-female union. The elevation of this level involved and involves certain rituals and recitations of sexual magic. Woman is the channel through which magical current manifests. Here is the text from chapter 15 of Crowley's De Arte Magica, which states specifically how the initiation of this degree should take place. This chapter is entitled Honorato Comatose Lucidity. And we quote, the candidate is made ready for the ordeal by general athletic training and by feasting, not by starvation, not by asceticism, but by feasting. On the appointed day, he is attended by one or more chosen and experienced attendants whose duty is a. to exhaust him sexually by every known means, b to rouse him sexually by every known means, 
every device and artifice of the courtesan is to be employed, and every stimulant known to the physician. Nor should the attendants wreck of danger, but hunt down ruthlessly their appointed prey. Finally, a candidate will enter into a sleep of utter exhaustion, resembling coma, and it is now that delicacy and skill must be exquisite. Let him be roused from this sleep by stimulation of a definitely and exclusively sexual type. Yet, if convenient, music, wisely regulated, will assist. The attendants will watch assiduously for signs of waking, and the moment these occur, all stimulation must cease instantly, and the candidate be allowed to fall again into sleep. But no sooner has this happened than the former practice is resumed. This alternation is to continue indefinitely until the candidate is in a state which is neither sleep nor waking, and in which his spirit, set free by perfect exhaustion of the body, and yet prevented from entering the city of sleep, communes with the Most High and the Most Holy Lord God of its being, maker of heaven and earth. The ordeal terminates by failure of the occurrence to sleep, and by success in which ultimate waking is followed by a final performance of the sexual act. The initiate may then be allowed to sleep, or the practice may be renewed and persisted until death ends it all. The most favorable death is that occurring during orgasm and is called mors justi, as it is written, Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like this. Unquote. This text written by Alistair Crowley, which is a ritual to ascend to level nine, step nine. We've discussed ritual in one of our earlier episodes of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, but I dare say none of the rituals that we mentioned were quite like this. At any rate, we intend in future episodes of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality to delve deeper into the joys and mysteries of sex magic. As they'd say, stay tuned. Sigmund Freud, in his revolutionary book, Three Essays on the Theory of Sexuality, written in 1905, referred to the clitoris as, quote, a piece of masculine sexuality. Marie Bonaparte, a great-grandniece of Emperor Napoleon I, in 1925 contacted Freud because of what she depicted as her frigidity. Her definition of frigidity being her inability to experience orgasms while having intercourse in the missionary position. It was to Marie Bonaparte that Freud made his famous remark, What does woman want? Later, she paid Freud's ransom so that he could leave Vienna. She persuaded Anton Zauerwald, a Nazi, to sign the papers enabling Freud to leave Vienna and also arranged for the transport to London of his book's collection of antiquities and, most important perhaps, his analytic couch which, as I understand it, is still very much sitting there in the Freud Museum of London. Have to go back there soon when the weather improves over in the old blighty old England. Troubled by her difficulty in achieving sexual fulfillment, Marie Bonaparte engaged in research. In 1924, she published her results under the pseudonym A.E. Narjani and presented her theory of frigidity in the medical journal Bruxelles Medicale. Having measured the distance between the vagina and the clitoral glands in 200 women, after analyzing their sexual history, she concluded that the distance between these two organs was critical for the ability to reach orgasm during vaginal intercourse. She identified women with a short distance who reach orgasm easily during intercourse, and women with a distance of more than two and a half centimeters who had difficulties though there was a third group of those in between. Bonaparte considered herself, by measurement one presumes, a woman with a long distance, and approached Joseph Alban, 
to surgically move her clitoris closer to her vagina. She underwent and published the procedure as the Halban Narjani operation. When it proved unsuccessful in facilitating the sought-after outcome for Marie Bonaparte, the physician repeated the operation. Ah, the lengths people will go to. In her book, Female Sexuality of 1949, she wrote, quote, The clitoris, woman's small phallus, must follow the lot of those temporary organs such as the thymus, which, after having fulfilled their function for a transitory period, must succumb to involution. Nevertheless, the most notable biological realization of the feminine organism is precisely the power to direct the clitoral libido, which is a masculine force, and its masculine expression, orgasm, to the cloacal vagina. And this transference is sometimes so complete that the clitoris remains insensible. Then the woman with the orgastic vaginal possibilities often overcomes the man since it would appear that ultra-vaginal are precisely those in whom orgasm is produced with the greatest ease and intensity. Unquote. The great-grandniece of Emperor Napoleon I. Conquering on yet another battlefield. Another prominent French psychoanalyst, Françoise Dolto, associated with Jacques Lacan, by the way, had a rather odd, neurologically-based theory of female orgasms expressed in her book, Feminine Sexuality. In this book, she distinguished four distinct orgasms experienced by a woman. The clitoral, the clitoral vulvar, the clitoral vaginal, and utero annexio. She wrote that the last, the uteral anexial, is the best because it is not consciously experienced by women and therefore women never mention it. Hold on, guys, and hold on, girls. So the best orgasm, according to this psychoanalyst, is the one which is never mentioned by women it is not consciously experienced. Okay. Boy, these orgasms, they lead one down various trains of thought. There's interesting pathways. There is much discussion, and we shall engage in more of it throughout the rest of this episode, on what is the best orgasm. We have talked a bit about the male orgasm in a previous episode with that title, and I promise to return to it in a future episode. On the subject of the female orgasm, and the special female sensuality from which it flows, Alcira Alizade tells us the following, quote, Sensuality may be compared to freely floating energy, which, if it is more easily expressed in the erogenous zones, mouth, anus, vagina, which are privileged areas for the enjoyment of pleasure, also expands over the surface of the body. Okay, we're going to insert a comment here. There is also the well-known phenomenon of the oral aggressive personality type, resulting from fixation at the oral sadistic phase and sublimation of the impulses of that phase in later life. This type of personality is characterized by violence, jealousy, and exploitation. So in this way, the mouth was never a privileged area for the enjoyment of pleasure, since biting is something in which infants indulge with no provocation. And, needless to say, there is the well-known anal-aggressive personality, a personality type characterized by obstinacy, obstructionism, defiance, and passive resistance. Such traits are held to stem from the anal stage, in which the child asserted himself or herself by withholding feces. So, as for the anus, neither is it a privileged area for the enjoyment of pleasure. But, back to Alcira Alizade's ideas about sensuality. And we quote from her again. Sensuality appeals to the senses, whose stimulation can give rise to an enormous voluptuousness, which in a certain sense is totally alien to the physiology of sexuality. The erogenous body resembles a Mobius strip in which the external and the internal follow each other without discontinuity as it moves from surface to depths, 
from skin to viscera. What makes feminine sensuality so attractive is its very complexity. Perception, sensation, emotion affect erogenicity, circumscribe this sensuality. Donald Winnicott was a British psychologist perhaps best known for his concept, The True and False Self. In this connection, I refer you to the extensive discussion of the entire notion of the self in contemporary philosophy contained in my most recent episode entitled Soap Opera. Winnicott used true self to describe a sense of self based on spontaneous, authentic experience and a feeling of being alive of having a real self. The false self, by contrast, Winnicott saw as a defensive facade, which in extreme cases could leave its holders lacking spontaneity and feeling dead and empty, behind a mere appearance of being real. It is within the context of this theory that I shall now quote a paper of his in which he discusses the putative ego orgasm. I would now like to go a little further in speculating in regard to the ego-relatedness and the possibilities of experience within this relationship, and to consider the concept of an ego-orgasm. I am, of course, aware that if there is such a thing as an ego-orgasm, those who are inhibited in instinctual experience will tend to specialize in such orgasms, so that there would be a pathology of the tendency to ego-orgasm. At the moment, I wish to leave out consideration of the pathological, not forgetting identification of the whole body with a part object, the phallus, and to ask only whether there can be a value in thinking of ecstasy as an ego-orgasm. When Winnicott uses the word ecstasy, it immediately brings to mind what we are focusing on in this podcast. Would ecstatic sensuality apply for Winnicott to an ego orgasm accompanying or a component of or a stimulus for a physical orgasm? Well, in a certain way, why not? An orgasm should be egocentric, as the psychoanalysts would say. It should make you feel good about yourself. It should make you feel good about all the components of your psychic life. It should make you feel good about your desires. It should make you feel good about the fact that your desires have to a certain extent been fulfilled by the orgasm and that the orgasm, as it were, is a floodlight that unveils, that reveals even further desires in your future that can also be fulfilled. Psychologists and other researchers never tire of doing studies to determine what percentage of women have orgasms, how they achieve them, and in some cases, what type, quote-unquote, those orgasms are. In an article entitled, Women's Experiences with Genital Touching, Sexual Pleasure, and Orgasm, Results from a U.S. Probability Sample of Women Ages 18 to 94, Debbie Herbnick and her colleagues from the Center of Sexual Health Promotion, University of Indiana, tell us that while 18.4% of women reported that intercourse alone was sufficient for orgasm, 36.6% reported clitoral stimulation was necessary for orgasm during intercourse, and an additional 36% indicated that while clitoral stimulation was not needed, their orgasms felt better if the clitoris was stimulated during intercourse. I have to say here that stimulation of the clitoris during intercourse is an interesting idea and depends, I would say, largely on the sexual position which the couple, you know, endeavors to engage in or chooses in that particular episode. Well, anyway, this goes along with other research which indicates that under 20% of women experience orgasm solely as a result of penile penetration, withdrawal, and repeated repenetration. Again, it would be interesting to ask of this group which sexual positions were more likely to induce orgasm without concurrent clitoral stimulation. Questions, questions. <laughs> 
Sarah B. Chadwick of the Department of Psychology and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and her colleagues conducted a study of 725 participants in which they asked them if they had ever had a bad, quote-unquote, orgasm experience during consensual sex. In reporting the results of their study, they refer to what is referred to in the literature as the, quote, orgasm imperative, unquote. According to these researchers, during the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, sexual pleasure and orgasm became symbolic of free love and a means to discovering oneself, positioning orgasm occurrence as a sign of progressive sexuality and orgasm absence, on the other hand, as a sign of regressive sexual ideology. Hey, we're hip and we're cool and we're groovy, as they used to say back then. I wasn't alive even that back then. And so therefore, we have orgasms and you dudes don't. <laughs> anyway, back to the article. Notably, this included ideas within the feminist movement that promoted the superiority of the clitoral orgasm which was lauded by activists as a celebration of women's sexuality and a rejection of male sexual expectations. They cite research which has shown that heterosexual women perceive orgasm as a romantic and sexual high point, a symbol of womanhood. Heterosexual women also often still feel that vaginal orgasms are superior to clitoral orgasms, despite evidence that clitoral and vaginal orgasms are biologically indistinguishable. I'm uh, quoting these people here. In support of this still much debated assertion, Chadwick and her colleagues cite research by Kenneth Ma in Yuchek M. Binick, published in 2001 in the Clinical Psychology Review. Chadwick also cites studies by herself and others, which assert that many women of various sexualities and men feel that being able to elicit women's orgasms is a valuable sexual skill, so much so that women will fake orgasms to ensure that sex is perceived as successful for their partners. Based on results of their study, these researchers came up with categories for bad orgasms. These included non-pressured orgasm during coerced sex, internally pressured orgasm during coerced sex, extremely pressured orgasm during coerced sex, non-pressured orgasm during compliant sex, which they define as when a person has sex to comply with their partner's interest in having sex despite not having been in the mood or having no interest themselves, internally pressured orgasm during compliant sex, externally pressured orgasm during compliant sex, non-pressured orgasm during desired sex, internally pressured orgasm during desired sex, and internally pressured orgasm during other kinds of sex. Oh my goodness, these people, these researchers do love them, our categories. Anyway, here's an example of a response from one of the study's participants, a 25-year-old bisexual woman, which they classified as falling into the latter category, namely, internally pressured orgasm during compliant sex. I had an ex, a woman, who could be very into my pleasure during sex, but also put a lot of performance pressure on me to come every time we had sex and also to have multiple orgasms. Often, if I didn't come or didn't come as much as she wanted me to, she would get frustrated and accuse me of not being attracted to her or prioritizing too many other things over our sex life, or she would complain about how the sex we had was vanilla and boring. Physically, it, the orgasm, was enormously less pleasurable. The build-up to orgasm would feel kind of irritating and uncomfortable. And then, when I came, it was just sort of a spasm without much pleasure associated with it. I sometimes would end up uncertain whether I had even had an orgasm or not. This is all in the context of what Chadwick and her associates refer to as the orgasm imperative, which they define as the notion that orgasm is the goal of sex, which, as they put it, 
constrains perceptions of satisfying sexual pleasure and pathologizes orgasm absence. Sex, sensuality, possible pre-sexual encounters during so-called dating, and so forth, all occur in a broader social context in which each of us has an actual or presumed identity. Depending on the context, on the situation, someone might be presumed to be available, presumed to be heterosexual, presumed to be open to sex, presumed to be poor, wealthy, intellectual, a nerd, whatever. In a paper entitled, Faking It Like a Woman? Question mark, towards an interpretive theorization of sexual pleasure, authors Stevie Jackson and Sue Scott of the University of Leeds in the UK discussed the possibility for developing a feminist approach to gendered and sexual embodiment. To quote from Jackson and Scott's article, sexual encounters arguably engender a greater sense of embodied selfhood than many other forms of social interaction. But it must be remembered that they are social. For it is here, especially when discussing desire and pleasure, that many theorists too easily fall back on understandings of the libidinal as fundamentally a property of the psyche, thus uprooting sexuality from social contexts. Here, we think of something that Professor Terence Hill wrote in his article, Sexual Pleasure and Well-Being. Quote, If pleasure is a matter of the mind, it is also a matter of cultural creation and experience. But back to Jackson and Scott. In contrast, we set out to analyze embodied selves in socially located interaction. In focusing on sexual pleasure, we consider how desire and pleasure may be reflexively understood in the context of everyday, every night, sexual practices. Taking orgasm as a paradigmatic case, we will argue that even this most individual, private, physical experience is always also social. As is my want, I'm going to pause here and consider their phrase, sexual encounters engender a greater sense of embodied selfhood than many other forms of social interaction. I question whether this is necessarily true in pickup sex, where often people are playing roles which they believe are appropriate to achieve their objective namely, sex. And by sex, I mean a situation where two people go off together, or at least get into a private setting where they are unseen by other people, disrobe to a greater or lesser extent, and engage in sexual activity beyond, let's say, kissing. The absence of other people is clearly not a necessary criterion in the case of swinging, where orgies are de rigueur, And one of the pleasures of having sex is that it is, in fact, a performance. However, let us pause for a moment to talk of casual sex in particular. Jennifer L. Piamonte, Terry L. Connolly, Stacy Gusakova of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor have, in fact, done a study which they report in an article entitled Orgasm, Gender, and Responses to Heterosexual Casual Sex, which was published in the Journal of Personality and Individual Differences. Their research concluded that orgasm explains how people feel about casual sex, which is to say that people who orgasm during casual sex are more likely to experience positive reactions afterwards. These researchers state, iconoclastically in our opinion, that, quote, Orgasms have long been considered an optional component of women's sexual satisfaction. An optional component? Hmm. They cite a study by Sarah I. McClelland of the Graduate Center at the City University of New York in which that researcher interviewed 41 women and none of the female participants explicitly invoked orgasm as the primary criterion for their sexual satisfaction. Instead, opting for relational aspects of a sexual encounter, such as feeling close to their partner. In these cases, the young women often described that orgasming was desirable but unlikely to occur. Mm 
unlikely to occur in casual sexual encounters. Okay. In focus groups with women of a variety of ages, 18 to 64 years, and also sexual orientations, another researcher found that heterosexual women younger than 24 years old expressed not expecting to orgasm during partnered sex, while women over 40 did. I invite you to draw your own conclusions from this. Orgasms are tremendously thrilling for women. As I have written elsewhere, women experience triumph in orgasm, while men experience defeat. After orgasm, the woman feels energized, competent, in control, on a new plateau entirely, whereas the man is, literally and figuratively, drained. Where were we? We were talking about the definition of having sex and took a detour into orgies where one of the pleasures of having sex is that it is, in fact, a performance. The performance aspect intensifies the pleasure not only of the two participants, but of everyone present at the orgy. If you are interested in such things, you may wish to check out our previous episode on polyamory, swinging, blah, 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 all those things. And then, one might ask, as I have asked in some of the earlier episodes of this podcast, if some individuals do not, in fact, also play roles as proto-relationships advance and develop. The roles that men and women adopt during their early encounters may, in fact, continue on as they proceed along what I have referred to in my soap opera episode as the marital trajectory. How many people out there have anxieties that if they drop their roles and let their true selves be known, their relationships will in fact collapse? How many of us are dealing with part object individuals, back to the ideas of Melanie Klein and object relations? Interesting, and I'll never lose my fascination with that. However, back to Stevie Jackson and Sue Scott in their article. They make the following extremely intriguing observation. Citing the work of sociologist Harold Garfinkel, they state, To see another's objectified body as sexual requires interpretive work. Even the simple identification of another as being gender-appropriate to our preferences is, as ethnomethodologists have demonstrated, a practical accomplishment. Further, To read another's body as desirable necessitates the mobilization of appropriate scripts and an ability to locate ourselves and the other within those scripts. So, I comment, there is a complementary, well, complementary in theory, epistemological process going on, and if I may add, once again, a constant dynamic of re-evaluation of roles and genders. Quoted from John H. Gagnon in William Simon's book, Sexual Conduct, Jackson and Scott write, To feel desire and pleasure requires not just a sensate body, a body physically able to feel, but an embodied decoding of sensation, being caressed, and internal states, bodily signifiers of arousal, as being sexually significant. The sources of arousal, passion, or excitement, the recognition of a sexual possibility, derive from a complicated set of layered symbolic meanings. We can explore and thus experience another's body through our senses, sight, smell, touch, while at the same time experiencing, feeling, sexual sensation in our own bodies. Those two events, if you will, go along in parallel. Unquote. When Jackson and Scott move on specifically to the subject of orgasm, they have some interesting observations to make. Quoting an article by Celia Roberts and others published in Women's Studies International Forum, in heterosexual intercourse, male orgasm is assumed to be virtually inevitable, whereas that of a woman requires male work and skill. Thus, a woman's spectacular demonstration of orgasm affirms her partner's sexual expertise. 
The demand for noise indicates that heterosexuality becomes an economy in which the woman's orgasm is exchanged for the man's work. The male performance ethic creates a demand that women enact a convincing performance of orgasm. The idea of women as passive recipients of male expertise requires an active use of their minds in order to perform being the body. Then Jackson and Scott make an intriguing observation. There is a lack of everyday discussion of doing sex and particularly of sexual pleasure. The most evident source from which it is possible to learn how to perceive its effects, the effects of sexual pleasure, and come to define them as pleasurable is the media. Whoa, Nelly. The media play a part in defining doing sex as pleasurable. If it were not for the media, we wouldn't know that sex was pleasurable. Ah, well, that's interesting. They go on to quote Susan Bordeaux, a professor of philosophy at the University of Kentucky. Quote, We learn what sexual arousal looks and sounds like from the movies. And, as with any other language, we pick up the grammar and syntax without being aware of it. After all, Jill Lewis, in her book chapter entitled, How Did Your Condom Use Go Last Night, Daddy? Sex, Talk, and Daily Life, recounted an actress's experience of this process. She had an image of generations of actors all imitating how they had seen sex love represented in other plays or films or books, conjuring up stereotypical postures and expected gestures. Well, here, once again, I have an opportunity to bring my own experience and expertise to bear on the subject at hand. As an executive, I have been involved in a number of films intended for general release to the public in theaters and so forth, which included sex scenes. In one film, it became obvious to us that the lead actor and lead actress were having sex in a dressing room immediately prior to filming their sex scene. Allow me to state that while the camera was rolling during that sex scene, the lead actor and the lead actress continued to have sex. Whether the orgasm at the end of that sex was real or faked, I have no idea, except to say that they orgasmed, quote-unquote, at the end of at least three takes. Roll out, (laughs) as we'd say on the set. But back to Jackson and Scott. These representations in films and other media are culturally available to us all, as a means of making sense of our own embodied sensations and of finding ways to communicate desire and pleasure in intimate interaction. There is some evidence that such images have long been drawn on by young people in learning to do sex. A prominent commentator on this phenomenon is Ava Alois in her book Consuming the Romantic Utopia. And I quote, These embedded media representations, however we may imagine that we have dismissed or repressed them, remain, in fact, as reflexive processes, whereby we interpret our own bodily responses and read those of a lover. This is really fascinating, how life is scripted both by society and by the media. And are the media scripted by society or vice versa? Let's go back to the more optimistic writer, Elcira Alizade, the Argentinian psychoanalyst. She had proposed the notion of a woman's ability to have a full-body orgasm, my term, so let us now return to her explanation of the mechanics by means of which such a thing may be said to occur. Quote, The clitoris, which is also feminine, transfers its erogeneity to other zones which are ready to play their part and freely activate the experience of giving oneself a body. Remember that? Giving oneself a body. There is transference, both from the clitoris and from other previously eroticized zones, such as the anus and the breasts. Again, in his three essays, 
Freud described this transference just as pine shavings can be kindled to set a log or harder wood on fire. In an article published in 1916 in the Freudian journal Imago, Lou Andreas Salome wrote about letting of the anus, that is to say, letting of what Luque Perra referred to as the passive cloacal erogeneity to the vagina. This is, needless to say, the same Lou Andreas Salome, who was, or so we are told, the object of Friedrich Nietzsche's erotic interest until his sister, the Nazi Elisabeth Furster Nietzsche, put the kibosh on it, and was later the love of the poet Rainer Marie Rilke. All of these transferences from the clitoris, etc., take place until, in the words of Alcira Alizade, the body experiences voluptuousness itself. Orgasms, she writes, may be oral, anal, tactile, auditory, clitoral, vulvar, or vaginal. As they flow, orgasms expand capriciously throughout the body, sketching a map of changing and unexpected erogenous zones. Preliminary pleasure comes very near to final pleasure, as far as feminine orgasms are concerned. Voluptuous discharges, surface orgasms, surface orgasms throughout the surface of the body everywhere, open the way to penetration orgasms. The woman is inherently bisexual, as stated strongly by Freud, so that she enjoys orgasms in two ways. On the one hand, she takes part in the vile way of enjoying, with her clitoris, her vagina, her erotic concentration on the cathexis of a single organ, her phallic illusion, even in an identification with the man. And on the other hand, she enjoys in the feminine way, with the hidden, the indefinable, the fantasy of origin, the diffusion of eroticism, bodily illegality, and of what psychoanalyst Shonda Ferenczi refers to as amphimixis, the fusion of eroticism into a superior energy from the interweaving of all of our senses. And this echoes back to our episode on synesthesia, on phenomena such as color orgasms. But those only scratch the surface of the synesthetic perceptions and states experienced by synesthetes during orgasms and by women synesthetes more than by men. Melanie Klein, whose discussion of the part object and of the depressive and paranoid schizoid positions we have discussed in depth in previous episodes, emphasized that woman tends to attach her narcissism to a greater extent over the whole of her body, whereas the man focuses his narcissism on his genitals. All of this raises the question, can man indeed be overwhelmed by a woman's sexuality, sensuality? We hinted that we would be asking that question at the very beginning of this episode, so here we go. We're going to ask it. Jean Cornu was a French psychoanalyst who was known for his humor, which made his listeners and readers both laugh and think. Hopefully, from time to time, we do the same thing here on this podcast, Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. His final book was entitled, Why Men Are Afraid of Women. In it, he writes of the phantasm, or is it a phantasm, of the woman's infinite orgasm and the fears that it generates in men. Such fears give woman, in the minds of men, the status of a demon and a witch. The man observes with terror the passage of enjoyment over a woman's body. Tell me what it is like where you were, from where I thought you would never come back, asked the man, and perhaps with good reason. The man is asking, tell me what it is like, to repeat, where you were, in that cosmic orgasmic state which you entered. Tell me what it was like, Please, I thought you would never return from that magical realm. Cornu suggests that fantasies of erogenous overflow and fear of uninhibited freedom of the senses will cause frigidity in women 
and problems with ejaculation or impotence in men. Interesting suggestion. What intrigues us is the association of the sexual act, and here we mean specifically heterosexual intercourse involving penetration and ejaculation on the part of the male, with fear. One wonders if this is primal, something the Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons felt. Why did they do it anyway? Why do other species do it? And this raises the interesting question, which species, in fact, do it for pleasure? Actually, there is very little evidence for this, of other species doing it for pleasure. Short-nosed fruit bats engage in oral sex to prolong their bouts of intercourse. However, there may be evolutionary reasons for this, although it could also be just for fun. Meanwhile, the clitorises of female dolphins possess nerve bundles, erectile tissue, and blood vessels, which could enable them to climax. Could, not do. And female Japanese macaques haven't observed orgasming, despite there being no direct reproductive benefits in this. And that, my friendly listeners, is all. As far as the animal kingdom is concerned, We'll leave the vegetable kingdom aside, we can assume, for good reason, that vegetables do not orgasm or feel pleasure. Is that necessarily true? What about when light hits them in the morning? Do they feel pleasure then? What's it like? What about a flower opening up to the sun, to the air, to the planets? Does that flower feel pleasure? My poetic side is showing. Better uh, wear thicker clothes. Anyway, so it would appear that we were singled out, as we will discuss further on an upcoming episode which will focus on the entire notion of sexual pleasure, because we believe that we should have it and are disturbed, afraid of some lack in ourselves. When we do not, religion comes along and tells us that it, sexual pleasure, is bad, is a sin, is something that will deprive us of a good brand of immortality and condemn us to an eternal life of impotence and frigidity. So, if sex is a sin, it is better not to have pleasure while you're doing it. So, there is nothing to fear here. On the other hand, in his book, Innocent Ecstasy, Peter Gardella discusses how, quote, Christian influences working through popular culture led Americans to seek ecstatic pleasure and to expect freedom from guilt in their sexual relations. The story begins, according to Gardella, with the obligations to orgasm, the obligations to orgasm in marital sex that emerged in Roman Catholic moral teaching during the 18th and 19th centuries. The first American writer to prescribe orgasm, as a doctor might prescribe aspirin or an enema, was Right Reverend Francis Patrick Kenrick of Philadelphia. In 1843, Kenrick wrote that a married woman had the right to bring herself to orgasm by touches, in quotes, after intercourse if she had experienced no climax during lovemaking. Kenrick also wrote that a husband who did not remain sexually active until his wife reached orgasm was guilty of a venal sin of omission and that it was a mortal sin for a wife to distract herself during sex, to avoid having an orgasm. Underlying this whole story is a single theme, the struggle to overcome original sin. The protagonists in the story all believe that human beings all came into this world already tainted by sin, and that this disordered condition involved the corruption of human sexuality. Ooh, interesting. On the third hand, prominent French psychoanalyst André Green reminds us of the work of anthropologist Geza Roheim, which, in his opinion, highlights, quote, the anti-sexual nature of all human groups, which conveniently overlooks what we would regard as the sexually permissive attitudes and lifestyles among some peoples of the South Pacific, for example. Andre Green goes on to mention that even inside psychoanalysis, 
this anti-sexual attitude reveals itself in different ways. I, meaning Green, have already expressed my objections about Melanie Klein's views and also those of Fairburn, but there are others. For instance, the ideas of Hartmann on the defense of an autonomous ego and a conflict-free sphere. Ronald Fairburn replaced Freud's pleasure-seeking orientation of psychic activity with an object-seeking orientation, which necessarily entailed a desexualization of Freud's theory. Then there was, of course, Melanie Klein herself, who also invoked the importance of the object from the start, but gave precedence to destruction. She also shifted from Freud's opposition between pleasure and unpleasure towards another couple of opposites, the good and the bad object. We've talked about this before. This difference was, in fact, of considerable consequence, orienting the basic principles of psychic activity in a direction which diverged considerably from Freud's hypothesis, Freud's hypothesis being pleasure-seeking. The idea of an object relationship starting at the beginning of life raised the breast to a supreme position. Its influence persisted throughout the phases of human life. The breast model extended to the genital phase and beyond. From now on, the penis was seen as a giving and feeding organ, in other words, as a breast, not only as a successor to the breast, but in fact, as a breast. Implicitly, fellatio was the nearest approximation to a fully satisfying sexual relationship. Approximation. Unquoting André Green, French psychoanalyst. Not to dwell on these considerations, however, might one ask also whether in the same sense cunnilingus involving sucking and licking the clitoris might also qualify as a fully satisfying sexual relationship. And therefore, the 69 position and activity would be, per this formula, the most fully satisfying sexual relationship. Well, theories lead somewhere. And this is where this theory seems to have led. Enough of this sexual position jive for a moment. I want to talk about why I like, love I should perhaps say instead, women so much. What is it about them anyway? What is it about you, my women listeners, anyway? What is it? Tell me. If I were to begin rhapsodizing about and writing peens and panegyrics to women's bodies, it would take me 16 lifetimes at a bare minimum, not to be confused with a bare maximum. For me, mutually and consensually, I reiterate, mutually and consensually, with respect, worship, honor, and joy. Caressing a woman's body is the highest form of pleasure and the highest form of sensuality. However, there is something else which brings me back to something I talked about earlier in today's episode. In females, the anterior commissure, a primitive structure, And here, let's stop for a moment and say primitive in terms of the evolution of humankind, a structure that goes back very, very far into our past, even into our pre-homo sapiens past, way, way back. I begin again. In females, the anterior commissure, a primitive structure tying the two hemispheres and linking unconscious with conscious material, might one say instead, linking the ego with the id, linking what has been repressed from what is conscious, is larger than in males. This dimorphism may explain why women seem more emotionally aware and more skilled at verbalizing emotions. A woman's left brain, the analytical side, is more extensively connected to her emotional right brain than a man's is. At the very beginning of today's segment, I talked about Freud's emphasis on making the unconscious conscious. 
about how this was a pathway to achieve, if you will, good mental health. Well, in terms of anatomy, neuropsychology, the structure of the brain, this is much more easily achievable for women than for men. Men criticize women for being too emotional, and many women writers valorize women's emotionality as opposed to men's lockstep rationality, as if we were all Mr. Spock's. But the key here is that women, more than men, can bring both the emotional aspects and the rational aspects to their approach to any given situation. And this is, for me, something that makes being with women so liberating, so fascinating, and such a joy. Okay, I'm becoming more guilty of digressions than Lars von Trier was a nymphomaniac or in the house that Jack built. In an article entitled, He Enjoys Giving Her Pleasure, Diversity and Complexity in Young Men's Sexual Scripts, Diane M. Morrison and her colleagues at the School of Social Work, University of Washington, report on a study of 648 sexually active heterosexual young men. Using exploratory factor analysis, they delineated sets of sexual scripts and sexual behavior themes. In the scenarios, they found both a traditional masculine player script and a script that emphasized mutual sexual pleasure. In other words, two contrasting scripts. Analysis of these theme items produce scales of drinking and courtship, monogamy and emotion, and sexual focus and variety. It should come as no surprise that the first factor they identified was traditional masculinity. As anticipated, they found a factor that featured elements of the traditional masculine script, similar to scripts and gender role experiences found throughout the literature. The fact that this factor emerged, even when using an unusual measure comprised of many scenarios, attests to its strength and robustness. However, from both the interview data and the factor analysis, these researchers concluded that young men find the traditional masculinity script ubiquitous and compelling, but not entirely attractive. The second factor that emerged from the factor analysis of the scenarios was quite different, and it reflects a dimension of young men's sexual scripts that they, the researchers, had not seen reported elsewhere, namely the sex-positive woman. Here is an example of a scenario offered to the participants to read to which many young men participating in this study responded positively. Tyler and Nicole consider themselves to be friends. They spend time with a group that has hung out together for more than a year. Everyone thinks that Nicole is really hot. Tyler thinks she's got a great sense of humor. One night, they ended up alone at his place. They were watching TV, and she put her head in his lap. He decided to see if she was interested in doing more, so he moved his hand down her body. Getting no resistance from Nicole, he ended up fingering her. Both of them enjoyed this. They've been seeing each other from time to time, spending the night and having oral sex or giving each other hand jobs. Tyler likes that Nicole is really into what they do together. Plus, he enjoys giving her pleasure. They don't let on to their friends that they are spending this kind of time together. I'm intrigued by the fact that the word orgasm occurs nowhere in this particular study. Perhaps this is a consequence of their failure, of the researcher's failure, I should say, deliberate or otherwise, to include orgasm in any of the scenarios they gave to their participants to read. Does a traditional masculinity script include giving the woman a credible orgasm? Or is it just about scoring? Has this changed over time? A crude way of asking this question would be whether young men today, of which I admit being one, brag about their conquests in terms of making the women they are with come. Not just, I scored with her, but I gave her this tremendous orgasm. I mean, you know, she came like fireworks, even more. 
Do young men say that? Do I say that? Well, I'm not going to tell you on this podcast. In our episode on sexual fantasies, we quoted from a paper by Alexandra Kate Hawkes of the Center for Healthy Sex, in which she wrote about the role of sexual play, and I would expand that expression to include sensual play, even synesthetic sensual play, in which everything in the lovemaking environment, including scents, things to nibble on, wine, even for those who like it, cannabis, are included. Anyway, about the role of sexual sensual play in the romantic erotic experience of two or more lovers. Kate Hawkes writes, Genuine play engages us in enriched emotional, psychological, and neurobiological levels simultaneously, and our unrehearsed responses to sexual play unite our mind, brain, and body for optimal satisfaction. An array of playful activities, kissing, hugging, tickling, caressing, visually, and finally genital stimulation, precede sex, making sex a subset of play. Play for children almost always involves toys, and the same is true for many adults. We plan to do an entire episode devoted to so-called sex toys, but we thought that we would do a brief digression here to discuss one of them, the vibrator. Vibrators are most commonly associated with masturbation by women and presumably also by gay men. Don't know about that. Just a presumption. In a 2017 study, Debbie Herbenick and her associates reported that over half of U.S. women reported having used a vibrator at some point in their lifetimes. Dennis Waskul and Michelle Anklin of Minnesota State University in Mankato conducted an online survey of vibrator use, which was published in the journal Sexualities. They found that the majority of participants in their study use vibrators both alone and in partnered sex. Interesting. In a 2009 study, Herbenek had found that 37.3% of women used a vibrator during partnered sex, and 40.9% reported using a vibrator during foreplay. In Mankato and Anklon study, 79.48% of their respondents reported having discussed using a vibrator with a partner, and 77.48% reported a positive, encouraging, and supporting response. Here is a response which one of the investigators cite as typical. I use my vibrator a lot with my partner. I don't orgasm from vaginal intercourse, so we use the vibrator during sex, so we both orgasm. I will use the vibrator while he gives attention to my breasts or neck and mouth. Sometimes he will enter me and we will have intercourse while I use the vibrator so we can both orgasm around the same time but usually it takes me longer to orgasm when we have intercourse, unquote. Here are comments from another of their participants. My current partner and I use vibrators all the time. He likes the feel of the vibrations when I use one on myself during penetrative sex, and he doesn't mind waiting and watching while I use a vibrator to get myself to orgasm before sex. Needless to say, there are purists out there who would disparage or eschew the use of vibrators, in fact the use of all sexual toys, for the reason that they are manufactured objects, gizmos made in China, or somewhere else out of plastic or who knows what. I am frankly not one of those people, and I very much look forward to discussing the use of buzzing nipple clips and so forth in a future episode. Stay tuned. In an article by David A. Putz of Pennsylvania State University entitled Men's Masculinity and Attractiveness Predict Their Female Partner's Reported Orgasm Frequency and Timing, the researchers explored relationships between the timing and frequency of women's orgasms and put it of measures of the genetic quality of their mates, including measures of attractiveness, facial symmetry, dominance, and masculinity. They found 
that women reported more frequent and earlier timed orgasms when mated to masculine and dominant men. Those with high scores and a principal component characterized by high objectively measured facial masculinity, observer-rated facial masculinity, partner-rated masculinity, and partner-rated dominance. As usual, a whole bunch of scales here, but they are quite relevant. Women reported more frequent orgasm during or after male ejaculation when mated to attractive men. Those with high scores and a principal component characterized by high observer and self-rated attractiveness. Putative measures of men's genetic quality did not, on the other hand, predict their mate's orgasm from self-masturbation or from non-coital partnered sexual behavior. They found that these objective measures of the quality of women's mates, quality meaning attractiveness and masculinity, significantly predicted the women's orgasms. Men's masculinity, a putative indicator of genetic quality, positively predicted a component of women's copulatory orgasm related to overall frequency and frequency before male ejaculation. Earlier timed orgasms suggest more intense sexual arousal and indeed are associated with greater sexual pleasure. Putz and his colleagues support this last contention with reference to an article by C.A. Darling and others entitled Female Sexual Response and the Timing and Partner Orgasm published in the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy. This raises an interesting question in and of itself. Are early timed orgasms for women associated with greater sexual pleasure? I'm applying for a major research grant to explore precisely this topic. Intense sexual arousal, their term, should, in the opinion of this podcast, lead to intense sexual expression throughout the intimate experience. For example, exploring different positions as per the Kama Sutra and other guides we have mentioned in this episode, and pausing for a bit, and allowing desire to take other forms, and then bringing it back even stronger. This is rather like the State Nine initiation, described in the Aleister Crowley ritual, which I described in detail earlier, or the sexual experience described by Jack Nicholson in the movie Chinatown. Forgive my Jack Nicholson imitation. I'm not even going to try. So there's this guy, Walsh. Do you understand? He's tired of screwing his wife. So his friend says to him, Hey, why don't you do it like the Chinese do? So he says, How do the Chinese do it? And the guy says, Well, the Chinese, they first screw a little bit. Then they stop. Then they go and read a little Confucius, come back, screw a little bit more. Then they stop again, go and they screw a little bit. Then they go back and they screw a little bit more, and then they go out and they contemplate the moon or something like that. Makes it more exciting. So now the guy goes home and he starts screwing his own wife. See? So he screws her for a little bit, and then he stops, reads some Confucius, whatever, and then he goes out to the room and maybe he reads Life magazine instead. Then he goes back in, he starts screwing again. He says, excuse me for a minute, honey. He goes out and smokes a cigarette. Now his wife is getting sore as hell. He comes back in the room. He starts screwing again. He gets up and starts to leave again to go and look at the moon. She looks at him and says, Hey, what's the matter with you? You're screwing just like a Chinaman. Unquote Jack Nicholson from the movie Chinatown. But back to our theme of why women prefer attractive masculine men. Research by Barry R. Komisiarek, distinguished professor of psychology at Rutgers University in the Garden State of New Jersey, and his colleagues, published in Annual Review of Sex Research and in the Journal of Sex Medicine, has shown that stimulation of the clitoris, distal vagina, and proximal vagina cervix is conveyed through different peripheral nerves, whereas And this is a crucial, critical, and vital whereas, essential to our entire understanding of women's orgasms and women's sexuality. Deep vaginal cervical stimulation activates the vagus nerve, among others, 
and activates different regions of the somatosensory cortex of the brain. In another article published in the Journal of Sex Medicine entitled The Relative Health Benefits of Different Sexual Activities, Dr. Stuart R. Brody reports that, quote, orgasms induced by clitoral stimulation and by penile vaginal intercourse differ in important ways, including indices of psychological and physical health and sexual function and relationship satisfaction being associated specifically with penile vaginal orgasm. Notably, greater likelihood of orgasm from penile vaginal intercourse, or more specifically, vaginal orgasm, orgasm elicited solely by penile vaginal orgasm without clitoral masturbation, is associated with physiological and self-perceived functioning within women. There is increasing evidence that vaginal orgasm consistency is associated with several characteristics of men with whom women are more likely to have vaginal orgasms. For example, the men tend to manifest greater duration and quality of erection, a longer penis, and indices of greater attractiveness and masculinity. The association between penis size and vaginal orgasm consistency, together with female preference for longer penises, was confirmed in cross-cultural samples, and it is consistent with theories of the possible adaptive function of vaginal orgasm. Penis size was found to be positively associated with health-related cues in men, including height, slimness, and overall physical activities or to 2D hyphen 4D digit ratio, indicating a higher level of prenatal testosterone exposure. Therefore, vaginal orgasm was proposed as an adaptive mechanism that could lead to greater reinforcement for penile vaginal intercourse with men of higher quality. Greater sexual responsiveness in deep vaginal and cervical areas could thus lead to more frequent penile vaginal intercourse. In both bivariate and multivariate analyses, vaginal orgasm consistency was associated with greater perceived sexual arousability during stimulation of the deep vagina, but not with greater sexual arousability at other vaginal sites, nor at the clitoris. This finding is consistent with earlier findings that women who are more likely to have vaginal orgasms have a preference for a longer penis that might more effectively provide deep vaginal and cervical stimulation and thus stimulate additional nerves to those stimulated by a middle or shallow vaginal stimulation, let alone only superficial clitoral stimulation. The results are consistent with an evolutionary understanding of vaginal orgasm as being an indicator of quality of the male partner, including the hypothesis that vaginal orgasm evolved as a part of a female mate choice system involving and favoring larger penises. This is a special case of the concept that women's orgasm evolved as a mechanism for male choice. Women who prefer longer penises are more likely to have vaginal orgasms, but not clitoral orgasms, indicating an orgasm reward system bound to the one reproductive sexual behavior per se. Multiple studies found intimate relationship quality and satisfaction to be associated with vaginal orgasm. And thus one should say also with longer penises. They don't say that, but it's kind of obvious from what they're implying in their research. To quote them again, our present study indicates that deeper vaginal stimulation, as would more probably occur with a man with a longer penis, is associated with greater vaginal orgasm consistency, so at least one aspect of the higher quality concept is supported, that higher quality aspect being longer penises. Let us make an effort to state this all somewhat differently. There is this thing called evolution. You, know, you remember Charles Darwin? Hear about him a lot. May have met him back in, you know, high school biology. 
So Charles Darwin came out with this concept of evolution. And the idea of evolution is that species evolve over time to become better, that is to say, to become more adaptive to their environment, and so that they can survive at a higher rate, and thus beat out competitive species. Well, why not? The process seems to have worked for many of us, <clears throat> except when there's you know, meteor strikes or something along those lines, or UFO comes, like the ones I happen to have seen the other night, but that's a, another topic for another time. So, evolution has come into play in terms of sex because women prefer men with longer penises because men with longer penises are better, more adaptive, as our researchers say, in other ways. They are slimmer. They are more athletic. They are healthier overall. So, women have these wonderful things, deep vaginal orgasms, which they can only get really, truly, with men with long penises. So, that's the selection process, the natural selection process, by means of which, by means of sex, by means of sexual pleasure, sexual pleasure, our species is getting better. Other species, as we remarked earlier, do not have this kind of deal of sexual pleasure. Are they lucky? Are they unlucky? I don't know. But in our case, sexual pleasure, perhaps even came into existence. Perhaps it's there. Perhaps this is the reason that we have it, that we can experience it in order to assist in evolution. This is a, a little bit simpler way of stating what our technical researchers have told us in these various articles, including by Mr. Putz and, you know, the others that we mentioned. So here, on your podcast, Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, the argument, or should one say the issue, is finally resolved once and for all. Size does count. It would be more than reasonable to state that a man with, uh, shall we say, less than average length penis has no hope of a relationship based on the sexual fulfillment of a woman. I Let me repeat that. It would be more than reasonable to state that a man with a, shall we say, less than average length penis has no hope of a relationship based primarily on sexual fulfillment of a woman. There is no way around it. Facts are facts. Returning for a moment to the people who were studying the use of vibrators, one asks if women in their research were using their vibrators for deep vaginal cervical stimulation as well as for clitoral stimulation. One would hope the latter. This would apply, needless to say, to long, dildo-shaped vibrators, which one presumes are available both online and in your friendly neighborhood sex shop, where Dominique and Danielle are ready to serve you into the wee hours of your fantasies. For myself, I am seriously considering doing an IPO for a worldwide chain of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality sex shops. Don't miss out. Consult with your investment advisor today. It is interesting that in their article, More Frequent Vaginal Orgasms Associated with Experiencing Greater Excitement from Deep Vaginal Stimulation, Stuart Brody, Ph.D., School of Social Sciences, University of West Scotland, and Katerina Klapilova, Ph.D., and Lucia Kratos, Master of Science of Charles University, Prague, Czechoslovakia, do not refer in any way to sex between women. One imagines that lesbians might be disturbed or even incensed upon reading this research, since it implies that forms of overtly and explicitly sexual activities between women, tribadism in which a woman rubs her vulva against her partner's body, for example, for sexual stimulation, especially for stimulation of the clitoris, and cunnilingus, are physiologically inferior sexual activities. By inferior, not our term, would be meant less pleasurable and less conducive to relationship bonding. On the other hand, we can return to what our Argentinian psychoanalyst had to say about the breadth, depth, and complexity of female orgasms. If one is orgasming over one's entire body, 
What difference does it make if the primary genital locus of that orgasm is in the clitoris, in the anus, or in the deep vagina? In an ideal world, not the world in which we live in, sad to say, such questions would be irrelevant if not immaterial. However, let us conclude on a different note entirely. In an article published in Frontiers in Psychology, Andrew B. Newberg, Nancy A. Winterling, and their colleagues at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia measured changes in resting brain functional connectivity with blood level, oxygen level dependent functional magnetic resonance imaging associated with a creative and meditation process that is augmented by clitoral stimulation and is designed not only to achieve a spiritual experience, but to help individuals manage their most intimate personal relationships. The meditative state is attained by both the male and female participants while the male stimulates the woman's clitoris. The goal of this practice, called orgasmic meditation, or OM, according to the practitioners, is not sexual, but to use the focus on clitoral stimulation to facilitate a meditative state of connectedness and calm alertness between the two participants, between the man and the woman. There were two test subjects, a male, giver, and a female, receiver, who performed the practice together in a closed room by themselves in a private area of the imaging facility. The male was clothed the entire time and did not receive any sexual stimulation. The female was also clothed except to allow exposure of her genitals. The room was prepared with a blanket and pillows on the floor according to the standard OM practice methods. The female would then lie down on the pillows while the male who was giving the meditation stimulus seated by the receiver's right side. The male performs stimulation of the clitoris for 15 minutes, which is performed while using a sterile glove and lubricant as needed. There was no sexual intercourse or penetration, and hence no risk of pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases due to the method of the practice. The results demonstrated significant changes, probability that they were random, less than 0.05. Hmm in functional connectivity associated with the OM compared to the neutral condition. For the entire group, that is to say males and females, there was altered connectivity following the OM practice involving the left superior temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, anterior cingulate, and insula. In female subjects, there was altered connectivity involving the cerebellum, the thalamus, the inferior temporal lobe, posterior parietal lobe, angular gyrus, amygdala, and middle temporal gyrus, as well as the prefrontal cortex. In males, functional connectivity changes involve the paramarginal gyrus, cerebellum, and the orbitofrontal gyrus, as well as cerebellum, parahippocampus, inferior temporal gyrus, and anterior cingulate. Overall, these findings suggest a complex pattern of functional connectivity changes in both members of the couple that result from the unique meditation practice, the practice of orgasm meditation, orgasmic meditation. The changes represent a hybrid of functional connectivity findings with some similarities to meditation-based practices and some with sexual stimulation and orgasm. This study has broader implications for understanding the dynamic relationship between sexuality and spirituality. Unquote, these researchers from Philadelphia. Regular listeners to this podcast may recall studies done at the University of California, Irvine, involving synesthesia and meditation, and specifically on those who practice meditation frequently and on their development of synesthesia by virtue of practicing meditation. We, as is our wont, 
we're reminded of how cosmic synesthetic sex can be. And indeed, of how cosmic sex can be. Despite all the categories and the figures and the chi-squares and the factor analysis done by researchers, which is wonderful. It opens our door. It lets us sort of get into the inside in a certain way while leaving us on the outside and leads us back then into our own sexuality and the glories of our own sexual experience. So here, on one episode of your podcast, Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, we have journeyed from orgies to meditation without batting a proverbial eyelash. But as far as orgasms are concerned, we have not even scratched the proverbial surface. Much, much more awaits you. But for the moment, we are going to dive off into our own private realm of sensuality. Sensual dreams. Bye for now. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and to thank the woman who inspired me to undertake the task of doing this podcast. Her name is Anita Di Francesco. She has her own podcast, and that is specifically what inspired me to do this. It is called Discover Joyous Love. And that podcast is a successor to a podcast she did previously called It's Your Voice. Anita Di Francesco is a psychotherapist, a somatic psychotherapist, an authority on organomic therapy and psychotherapy, the work of Wilhelm Reich. She is a renowned author of two books, Live Free, Recreate and Liberate Your Life, and The Donna Gentili Story, a spellbinding true crime thriller about the murder, the brutal murder of her first cousin and her attempts to identify the killer. I strongly recommend Anita Di Francesco as a relationship counselor, as a psychotherapist, and as someone you should listen to on her podcast. You can find her at two websites. One is tantrawisdom.com. The other is discoverjoyouslove.com. She also has Facebook pages, a Facebook page entitled Tantra Wisdom, her Facebook business page, and also Love and Relationship Coach. Check her out. You won't be disappointed.